So welcome back. Uh, today we're going to continue on and talk more about how musical notes and other sounds can be decomposed into combinations of pure tones with specific frequencies. So let's review what we were talking about last time. We said that if you take any periodic time graph with some particular frequency, then you can actually think of that as a sum of these sinusoidal time graphs with that frequency and various multiples of it. So if you have, say, this particular time graph that corresponds to a note on a saxophone, then we could actually decompose that into this sinusoidal wave with the same frequency as the original note, plus some wave with double the frequency and triple the frequency and so forth. And the combination of those pure tones sounds to us just like the original note. And so just some language here, the basic frequency of a musical note, so the inverse of the period here, that's what we call the fundamental frequency. And if you have a musical note with some fundamental frequency, then usually, unless it is itself a pure tone, usually that note is made up of that fundamental frequency plus combinations of multiples of the frequency, plus pure tones with multiples of that frequency. Okay, so those higher pure tones, those are referred to as the second harmonic, the one that's double the frequency, the third harmonic, and the fourth harmonic, and so forth. Another bit of language that's sometimes used is to say that this wave splits up into various partials. So these pure tones that compose the sound are the partials. And we could say that the partials include the fundamental plus various overtones. So the physical consequence of this statement, which is basically just a mathematical statement, it's a statement that is called Fourier's theorem in mathematics, that any periodic function can be written as a sum of these sinusoidal waves. The physical consequence in terms of music is that you could take the sound of a saxophone and that is entirely equivalent to a sound that would be produced by just combining pure tones with the fundamental frequency and various multiples. So in principle, if you had a saxophone playing a note that's 100 hertz, and then you had a perfect tuning fork that produced a pure tone of 100 hertz and another one of 200, another one of 300, and so forth, if you had just the right combination of amplitudes for those notes, then the saxophone sound and the sound of this combination of tuning forks would be the same. And so in the simulation that I showed last time, we had these three different panels that all represented the information about the wave or the sound that we were hearing. And so the bottom panel is the time graph for the note. It represents the displacement as a function of time for the air, for the eardrum, or for a microphone. And you see that is periodic with some characteristic shape. Now we understand that that shape can be understood as the sum of these pure sinusoidal waves, each one corresponding to a pure tone. And the top diagram basically just shows you how much of each of those pure tones do we have in order to get the bottom graph. And so the height of this red bar is just the amplitude of that pure tone with the fundamental frequency. This one shows the amplitude of the pure tone with double that fundamental frequency, so that what we call the second harmonic and this one shows that there's also some third harmonic, some fourth harmonic, and some fifth harmonic. So this particular time depend, this particular periodic time graph that corresponds to a certain musical sound with a certain um, quality to it, 
Uh, that's a combination of five different pure tones, which are harmonics of this fundamental frequency of 100 hertz. Okay, so this kind of a graph, we refer to it as a spectrum graph because it's very much like the spectrum of light. When you think about white light, like sunlight, and you put that through a prism, then you see that it decomposes into all of the different colors of the rainbow. And so it's the same idea here. You take a sound and you can understand that as a combination of all of these different basic frequencies. Now, in general, there's no reason why we can't combine other frequencies as well. And so when we think about just general sounds, not just one particular musical note, we can describe them by saying which frequencies are present and how much of each frequency is present. And so we could use a, a graph like this, which I'll call a spectrum graph. And so for the particular case of a musical tone, then you see a fundamental frequency and various harmonics coming in with different amounts. But then other kinds of sounds, if you played a different musical note, then the fundamental frequency would be different, and then you'd have the harmonics of that fundamental frequency. And later we'll see examples where other sounds, which are not musical notes, can also be understood as combinations of these pure tones with specific frequencies. Okay, so I want to give you just something to think about to make sure you understand this concept of the spectrum graph. Okay, so the the second way we now have of representing the information about a sound or a musical tone in particular. So here's an example where I say you have these two tuning forks. One of them is a 100 hertz tuning fork, the other one's a 500 hertz tuning fork and they're playing together at different volumes. The time graph looks like this one that we saw in a previous lecture when, when I had one of them. Actually, in the previous lecture, I was actually whistling for the higher sound and we had a tuning fork for the lower sound. Now it's two tuning forks. So this is the time graph, and what we wanna know is what will the spectrum graph look like for this particular combination? So maybe pause the video and take a minute to think about that and see what you would come up with for the spectrum graph in this case. Okay, so let's talk through this. The first thing we need to understand is that these tuning forks, they more or less produce a pure tone, especially if we've let them go for a little while. And so individually, the tuning forks will produce time graphs that are sinusoidal, and the difference is going to be the amplitude and the period. So the smaller tuning fork produces a sinusoidal time graph with one-fifth the period because it has five times the frequency. Now, what about the relative amplitudes here? Well, looking at the top graph, you can see that it looks like this second graph here but with little wiggles on it. And so we remember that the way to understand the top graph is just as the mathematical sum of these two graphs. So at every point, you just add up the value of this one and the value of this one. And so we can recognize that the amplitude of the smaller wiggles is a little bit smaller than the amplitude of these big wiggles. Okay, that's why it more or less still looks like a up and down curve with little wiggles on it. And so we can conclude that this 100 hertz tuning fork was being sounded at a larger amplitude. So it's probably a little bit louder than the smaller tuning fork. And so now we're ready to convert this information into a spectrum graph. And so instead of having to draw all of these wiggles, well, the spectrum graph already takes that into account because each frequency on the spectrum graph, uh, it's implied that you have a sinusoidal curve um, with that frequency when the, when the graph is not zero there. And so in this case, we just have these two frequencies, 100 hertz and 500 hertz, and the spectrum graph just shows the amplitude for each of those. 
And so we've concluded that the, the lower frequency one has a larger amplitude, the higher frequency one has a smaller amplitude. And so it'll look something like this. Maybe I should have made the higher frequency one even a little bit smaller because it looks like the amplitude there is more like, I don't know, a, an eighth of the amplitude here. So this probably should have been shorter. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Now, remarkably, it's possible to actually use a computer to spit out the exact spectrum graph for any given time graph. Okay, so this uses a mathematical operation called a Fourier transform. So that's basically going from, oops, going from this graph to this graph. That's something that, that is a Fourier transform. It just tells you which pure tones is, is a musical tone composed of and or what sinusoidal, what frequencies of sinusoidal waves, what frequencies and amplitudes you have to add up to get a specific time graph. And so we can make a computer do one of these Fourier transforms and then just display the spectrum graph for any sound that we record. Okay, so I want to just give you a demonstration of that. So let's have a look here. So what I have here is a spectrum analyzing app. And what it does is it takes the signal from a microphone, which is like a time graph, and it automatically converts that into a spectrum graph. So it figures out which frequencies of sound are present in the sound recorded by the microphone and it shows a graph of how much of each frequency is present. And so what I'm going to do is do a couple of demonstrations. First I'll show you what it looks like if I play the sound from two different tuning forks separately and then together. And then we'll try looking at the spectrum for a couple of musical notes from different instruments and then for some ordinary sounds. So let's try it out. Okay, so that was a, uh, it says 128 hertz, but I think actually it was uh, a little bit higher than that. I think the, the tuning fork is, uh, has the wrong number written on it. Uh, so we saw basically one dominant frequency and there was actually a little bit of a higher frequency. So there was maybe a, a, another type of vibration happening with the tuning fork at the same time. Uh, let me play a, a higher pitched tuning fork. So this one says 427 hertz. Okay, and so you could see actually at the, the right at the top of the screen there, it says, uh, well, it's picking up 428 hertz, so that's pretty close to what it says on the tuning fork. And again, we mainly just have one frequency. Uh, let me show you what it looks like if I play a recorder now, and then I'm gonna play a harmonica note, and, and then I'm just gonna make some noise. So let's, uh, let's try those. let's zoom out a little bit so I'm going to go all the way up to 5,000 Hertz we'll try that again
Okay, so you saw the the huge difference there. We already saw this with the time graphs where the musical notes had these nicely periodic time graphs and the regular sounds were all random. And now we can see this very dramatically in the spectrum graphs. When you look at the spectrum graph for uh, an ordinary sound, just some noise, then you see that it basically has all sorts of frequencies present, um, all the way from from tens of hertz uh, way up here. If I if I try that again, uh, going up to let's say twenty thousand hertz. Let's see what that does. So here we go. Okay, so a huge range of frequencies present, whereas we saw that when I played the musical note then for the pure tones we were basically just getting one frequency and for the more complicated instruments for the recorder and their harmonica which sound a little bit nicer then you're getting that combination of a fundamental frequency and then various multiples of the frequency and those would have different amplitudes let's see the harmonica one more time with this full range of uh, frequencies present Okay, so you see that you, you get, uh, even though the fundamental frequency is down there, this says 352 hertz, we're actually getting double that and triple it and quadruple that. And all the way up, we get these perfect multiples all the way up into 15,000 hertz, close to 18,000 hertz. Uh, this is the high end of the range of human hearing. So that complex harmonica tone is coming from a combination of all sorts of different higher harmonics and they all there's a particular shape a particular pattern of those frequencies that are present that make that into the sound we associate with a harmonica okay uh, so just to summarize a couple of things from that video we saw that when I played a musical tone, then generally that had a specific fundamental frequency and then a combination of these higher frequencies that were multiples of that fundamental. So the fundamental, this is the second harmonic, third harmonic, fourth harmonic, and we had different amplitudes for those. And that varies between different instruments. Whereas this, with the ordinary sound, like the shh kind of noise, then we had all sorts of frequencies present, pretty much all the frequencies present. It was just a big, big green blur. And so what we're going to get into next time is like, why do musical instruments produce these combinations of a fundamental tone and then just multiples of that? Why, why does that happen? That's in some ways what defines a musical instrument. And um, so what we'll see is that, and we've already seen in the demonstration, you know, different musical instruments produce these higher harmonics uh, with different amounts. And so you might have a little bit more of, of the odd ones in some instruments and maybe more of the even ones in other instruments. And, and that's really what distinguishes the sound of the different musical instruments. So we're going to get to that next time. And so that's it.